Well, good morning. It's good to be here this morning, and I bring greetings from Liberty Baptist Church in Liberty, Missouri, where I get to uh, serve as an elder, and we're just so excited to uh, be in another faithful local church. I have met Stefan several years ago in some seminary courses and have really enjoyed our friendship, and so it's an honor for me to come and uh, fill this pulpit and get to preach God's Word. Let's begin with uh, prayer. Father, we come before you now, and we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your kindness to us. God, thank you for allowing us to come together to sing praises to your name, to glorify you by hearing the preached word. And I pray, God, that you would let us be changed by it, that your word would convict us where needed, that it would encourage us where needed, and that it would equip us for all that you've called us to do. Please be with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you know, each new year, comes the sometimes obnoxious and usually short-lived New Year's resolutions. In our culture, we love the idea of a fresh start, especially after the conclusion of a year like 2020. How many times did you hear towards the end of last year, I just cannot wait for 2020 to be over? So we make these non-binding resolutions that usually help to motivate us and to help us make significant change in our life. And to be honest, most of these resolutions are good. They're things that need to happen in our lives. They're things that need to be done. For example, the number one on uh, most people's New Year's resolutions list is to get in shape. So for those of you who attend a gym year-round, the New Year is one of the most dreaded times of the year. You know that you'll show up January 1st or the days after, and it will be packed with a bunch of newbies who have no idea what they're doing. And they're going to slow down and interrupt your normal routine. But you also know that just a few short weeks after that, everything's going to be back to normal because most of the time, as the freshness of the new year wears off, so does their desire to be faithful to their new year resolution. Well, in a similar way, I want to give you guys a resolution that I hope will mark your church. And my hope is that this resolution will not simply pass away like most new year's resolutions. Rather, my prayer is that this resolution would mark you all for the years to come. Now, my resolution for you is that you would resolve to be a church that is united for the sake of advancing the gospel. That you would be united for the sake of advancing the gospel. There are many things that churches resolve to do and should resolve to do each year. Yet there's not much more important than resolving to advance the gospel together. This is, after all, one of the major reasons why you even exist here as a body in Strasbourg, to magnify Christ and to make Him known here in your community. So my hope is that you will agree this is a simple resolution that you can get behind and that you would do it together. Now, to give you the biblical justification for this resolution and to challenge you into how you can be more effective in sharing the gospel, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1 verses 12 through 26. So if you want to turn there in your Bible, I'm gonna, that's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time, and we're just going to be looking and walking through some of these verses. And I want to say from the start that we'll only be able to give an overview of these verses this morning. We're not going to be able to go into every nuance of the text, but if you have questions, feel free to ask me afterwards. Sometimes as preachers, it's important to give your people a bird's eye view so that you don't miss the forest for the trees. So you see the big picture of what the text is aiming at. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Now, before we jump into our text, I want to also set up the context of the book of Philippians for you. So the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle, and he wrote it to the the church at Philippi while he was in prison, likely in Rome. Philippi, ancient Philippi, was a Roman colony in what is today northern Greece. And it was a strategic city because it was a major stop on a very important and well-traveled road called the Ignatian Way. Paul founded the Church of Philippi there on his second missionary journey. Now, something else that's not in our Bibles that's important about ancient Philippi was that it was the site of one of the largest land battles that has ever taken place in human history. If you remember a little guy named Julius Caesar, well, he was assassinated, and after there was this massive civil war. And Philippi was actually, in the plains of Philippi, was actually the site of this massive battle known as the Battle of Philippi. And it was between Julius Caesar's assassins, Brutus and Cassius, 
and his avengers, Mark Antony and Octavian, future Caesar Augustus. There were roughly 200,000 soldiers in this battle. And after the battle, a lot of the soldiers just retired right there in the city of ancient Philippi. So needless to say, there would have been a lot of tension in this city as soldiers from both sides of the war retired in the same place. And the reason that this is important is because Paul uses numerous military terms throughout the short book of Philippians to communicate to them. And this is somewhat normal for Paul. He would often use metaphors from everyday life to make something in God's word and God's truth more uh, communicative, communicative to them. So concerning the military terms in the book of Philippians, one of the major themes throughout the letter is that they would um, advance the gospel together, that there would be unity as they advance the gospel. That's why that is our New Year's or resolution for this church. But the word advance was a common military term for the advancement of an army. In chapter 2, verse 25, Paul calls Epaphroditus his fellow soldier. Once again, in chapter 4, verse 2, Paul calls on his true yoke fellow. And in the original language, this true partner was actually a very technical military term. And in the Roman army, this term referred to what was known as a pup tent buddy. It was basically the smallest group of Roman soldiers that would sleep together in the tent. He calls on this pup tent buddy to restore the unity in the church. And all of this helps us understand one of the main themes throughout the book of Philippians, which is the focus of this sermon, unity for the sake of advancing the gospel. In fact, in chapter two, 4, verse 2, we read about a conflict within the church between Yodia and Syntyche. Apparently, there was division within the church, so Paul writes this letter in part to call them to be united again. And all throughout the letter, he calls them to this unity. We see in chapter 1, verse 27, where he says that they're, he's hoping to hear that they're standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel. In chapter 2, he describes how they should not do anything out of selfish ambition. And then he gives them the example of Jesus who humbled himself. He didn't put his preferences first, but he humbled himself to the point of death on the cross. At the end of chapter 2, then he gives them two further examples of this selfless attitude in Timothy and Epaphroditus. And then finally, he urges in chapter 4 that the two in conflict, Euodia and Syntyche, would agree in the Lord. So you have these two themes, unity and then the advancement, namely of the gospel. Unity for the sake of advancing the gospel. So that is why I think that this is the perfect book, and our passage in particular this morning is the perfect passage to see the rationale that you, Strasburg Baptist Church, should be unified for the sake of advancing the gospel. So to give you a little sneak peek of where we're going in the moments that follow, we're going to see three elements needed to advance the gospel. That is, the trust needed to advance the gospel, the humility needed to advance the gospel, and the mindset needed to advance the gospel. My purpose in preaching this sermon this morning is that we would all collectively be reminded anew that as Christians and as members of this local church, that one of the fundamental aspects of why you exist is to live your life with a focus on making much of Christ and advancing his gospel. So let's consider the first element, the trust needed to advance the gospel. If you have your text, Philippians 1, look down at verses 12 and 13 with me. Paul says this, Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. As I mentioned a moment ago, Paul was in prison when he's writing this letter. And you would think that this was one of the worst places for one of the most bold and zealous missionaries to be. I mean, just think about it. What would Paul be doing if he were not in prison? Well, he would be in the synagogue preaching Christ and Him crucified. He'd be on the streets sharing the good news of the Messiah, or he'd be traveling to the next great city to share Christ with anyone who would listen to him. But instead, he's bound, he's stationary, and he's awaiting his trial. Most people would assume that this was such a waste. They might even question God, saying, God, what are you doing? We have the Patrick Mahomes of missionaries sitting in the bench in the jail. What are you thinking? Why would you allow this to happen? Yet that's not how Paul viewed the situation. 
what most people would have thought would have hindered the advancement of the gospel, Paul, being in prison, Paul says that actually that is the very thing that has advanced the gospel. And he says that this has happened in two ways. First, that the whole imperial guard has been made aware of his imprisonment, that is, is on behalf of Christ. And second, that his imprisonment has encouraged other Christians to preach the gospel more boldly. Now we'll look at the second point in a moment, but who was this imperial guard that Paul mentioned? Well, the imperial guard, also known as the Praetorium, was an elite group of about 9,000 soldiers who served as a special bodyguard for Caesar. This was a very influential group that actually deposed and promoted Caesars or emperors. In fact, they assassinated the emperor Caligula and they put Claudius on his throne in his place. But this powerful group of men didn't intimidate the apostle Paul. Paul knew that Caesar was not actually Lord, but Christ was. And Paul says that it became known through the whole imperial guard and among all the rest, and the all the rest there is likely everyone else that's associated with his trial and imprisonment, that he was in his chains on behalf of Christ. Everyone who came into contact with Paul while he was in prison was guaranteed to hear the reason why he was there. And that meant they were going to hear the gospel. So instead of imbuing his situation with self-pity, with fear, with discouragement, Paul trusted God's providence and he viewed it as an opportunity to share the gospel with those who would not likely have been around him had he not been in prison. I mean, think of the guy that must have been chained to Paul or was around him all the time. He was probably very sick of hearing Paul talk. But nonetheless, Paul viewed it as an opportunity. And as the new guard came, guess what Paul was going to do? He was going to share the gospel with him. And we can learn much from Paul's example. There's going to be moments in our lives where we are not sure what God is up to. It may be unclear why God is leading you through a certain trial or experience. But one aspect of that situation may very well be that God is placing you around someone that you would not have been around had things been different. We must trust that God doesn't waste a single moment of our lives, but that every single moment has a purpose. A good illustration of this is in November 1964, there was uh, anarchy which broke out in the Belgian Congo. Now, a missionary was there, and his name was J.W. Tucker. And he knew that he was in a risky situation, but he decided to stay where God had placed him. The situation grew apparently more and more dire and more and more serious, yet Tucker remained there in the midst of the great trial and risk. One day, however, a mob attacked and killed Tucker with sticks and clubs and broken bottles. They took his body, they threw it in the back of a pickup truck, they drove a good distance, and they chunked it into a river where he was eaten and consumed by crocodiles. This river was called the Bamakande River, and it is now in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here you have this missionary, J.W. Tucker, who had risked everything for the gospel. He had trusted in God in a dire situation, was willing to give his life in order to be faithful, yet he seemingly had nothing to show for it. But 30 years later, a close friend of Tucker's was in the country where he was killed, and he learned of how God had used his sacrifice to advance the gospel. Now what you need to know is the Bamakande River flows through the middle of the Mengbeto tribe, a people, people virtually without the gospel. And during this time, there was a civil war. And the Mengbeto king became distressed with the violence, and he appealed to the central government for help. Now, the central government responded by sending a man uh, there named the Brigadier. And this Brigadier was a well-known policeman of strong stature and reputation. And a crucial point in the timeline is that J.W. Tucker, that missionary that had been martyred, martyred, had won the Brigadier to the Lord just two months before he was killed. The brigadier determined, therefore, to reach the Mengbeto tribe with the gospel because he believed that it was the only true way for peace to come to this civil war. But being a relatively new Christian, he did his best, but there wasn't seeming to be much fruit. No one was listening. But then one day, he heard of this Mengbeto tradition that said, if the blood of any man flows in the Bamakande River, you must listen to his message. This saying had been with this tribe from time immemorial. And therefore, the brigadier called the king and all the village elders, elders, and they gathered the full assembly of the tribe. And he said, some time ago, a man was killed, and his body was thrown into your Bamakande River. The crocodiles in this river ate him up. 
His blood flowed in the river. But before he died, he left a message. He continued, The message concerns God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world to save sinners. He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. And I received this message, and it changed my life. And as the brigadier preached, people began to fall on their knees and cry out to the Lord. Many were converted, and since that day, the church among the Mungbetos has been growing and coming to Christ in droves because of the man's blood who flowed in the Bamakande River. At first, what appeared to be such a tragedy and a waste in God's plan actually was his plan all along to bring many, many people to the faith in his son. So the same was true for Paul's imprisonment. The same can be true and is true in your life. So let's pray. Let's be people who, when we get into difficult moments, when things seem to be going all of the wrong ways, our first thought is tempted, we are tempted to be frustrated and to complain. But we wouldn't. Rather, we would trust God and His kind providence, and we would know that He's led us to this moment for this reason. And in these moments, let's seek to make account for the advancement of the gospel. You never know who God might place around you because of the trials you are in or how God might use your trials or even death to save others. So the first element needed to advance the gospel is trust. You must trust God in order to advance the gospel. But Paul's imprisonment not only advanced the gospel because he was in, around the imperial guard, it also emboldened other believers to speak the word or to preach the gospel without fear, which leads us to the second element needed to advance the gospel, and that is humility. The humility needed to advance the gospel. Look back down at our text in verses 14 through 18. It says this, Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord from my imprisonment and dare even to speak the word fearlessly. To be sure, some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. These preach out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. But what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now in these verses, we see good news and bad news. The good news, as mentioned a moment ago, is that Paul's imprisonment has advanced the gospel, not only because he's around the imperial guard, but it has also had an effect on the believers' lives that were there. And they were be being emboldened to preach the gospel without fear. So that's the good news. The bad news is that some of these motives were not pure. Some who are preaching gospel, the, the gospel in light of Paul's imprisonment, were doing so falsely or with false motives. So Paul says at the end of verse 15 that some were preaching Christ out of goodwill. And then he expands on this group by saying in verse 16 that they were preaching out of love, knowing that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel. These preachers were motivated for good reasons. They were molded, motivated out of love for Paul, knowing that his imprisonment was a divine appointment from God. They likely stepped into the gap left by Paul's imprisonment and carried on some of his ministry there in the city of Philippi. Not because they wanted to make much of themselves, to make a name for themselves, but because they wanted to see the gospel go forward and continue to advance. So those are the good motives. There's also those, though, however, unfortunately, that were motivated with impure motives. Verse 17 says that some proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition not sincerely, thinking that they will cause me trouble in my imprisonment. Now, this group clearly has ulterior motives in view, but it is hard to pinpoint exactly what they were seeking to do. More than likely, they were trying to cause Paul emotional anguish as he was in prison, and they were still free to preach the gospel. They could have been trying to steal some of his success or some of his followers or prominence, knowing that he could not do anything about it while he was in prison. In other words, they looked at Paul's circumstance, his imprisonment, as the perfect chance for them to steal some of his thunder and advance their own name. But notice how Paul responds in verse 19. What does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. And in this response, we see two noteworthy points. First, it is important to see that both groups, those with pure motives and those with impure motives, were preaching the true gospel. 
We see in other letters that Paul wrote, and even in chapter 3 of the book of Philippians, that he had no problem denouncing those who were preaching a false gospel. Yet in this situation, he clearly states that Christ was in fact being proclaimed. So the content of the believer's proclamation was good and right, but their motives were pro for proclaiming the gospel were suspect. Now, though Paul doesn't explicitly condemn false motives here in our passage, he does clarify just verses later, at the beginning of chapter 2, that the Philippians should do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, they should consider others as more important than themselves. So it is not that Paul is saying that motives don't really matter as long as Christ is being proclaimed. I think that would be to misunderstand Paul's point. We can see from other passages of Scripture that God sees our hearts and that our motives absolutely do matter. And in our modern context full of celebrity preachers and social media, it is crucial for us to understand that as we seek to advance the gospel, our motives do matter. The only one that really matters when it comes to evaluating our success or failure is God. And the truth is that you all know this, God can see your heart. Just think about it for a second. At the end of the day, it does not matter what people think of you and your ministry. We can deceive people our entire lives by saying the right things and by doing the right things at the right times. But church, you cannot deceive God. He sees your heart and He will hold you accountable for your motives. So confess your false motives now. Ask Him to forgive you of your impure motives and seek to advance the gospel with humility. Second for Paul, it is crucial that he was not after his personal fame, his reputation, or his status, but he was rather after Christ being proclaimed. And that is why I said that the second element needed to advance the gospel is humility. In Paul, we have a great example of one who was not concerned with self. He wasn't eager to have credit for what he was doing and what he was accomplishing for Christ. Rather, his attitude was making much of Christ and not himself. In fact, at the end of verse 10, he says that he rejoices not in the advancement of Paul, but in the fact that Christ is being proclaimed. And so church, as we seek to advance the gospel, humility is a fundamental aspect of that advancement. The ministry, after all, is not about us. It's not about you or me or our preferences. It is about the Lord being honored. It is about the Lord being made known. After all, the, the ministry of this church, Lord willing, will continue long after all of us here are dead and gone. A good example of this humility that Paul's after and that we should be after is found in the 18th century evangelist named George Whitfield. He was arguably the most prominent evangelical in our country's first Great Awakening over 250 years ago. So in addition to his role in the Great Awakening, Whitfield was also one of the founders of the Methodist movement with a man named John Wesley. Now, when there was a great schism growing and developing within this new movement between Whitfield and Wesley, Whitfield decided that he would give up his leadership role and that he would step down so that Wesley would take over in full, if you will, and that the schism would not separate or break the movement. Now, Whitfield's followers were offended by this. They urged him, take back your position of leadership, and they warned him. This is what they said. Your name will be lost to history if you do not take your position back. And this is what Whitfield said. My name, let the name of Whitfield perish only if the name of Christ be glorified. See, Whitfield recognized that the ministry, the Methodist movement that was seeing lots of people come to Christ in, None of that was mattered if it was all about Whitfield or Wesley. None of it would last if it was all about Whitfield or Wesley. What it should have been about, and Whitfield recognized this, was about making much of Christ, magnifying Christ and His name being known, His name being remembered. So my prayer for us this morning is that that type of humility would mark us, that it would be a prominent characteristic of our life and especially of this church as you seek to advance the gospel. Don't let your singular preferences get in the way of the gospel going forward. Instead, be united for the sake of advancing the gospel. So we've seen that the first element needed to advance the gospel was trust. We must trust God as we seek to advance the gospel. The second was humility. And now finally, consider with me the third, 
the mindset needed to advance the gospel. The mindset needed to advance the gospel. Look back down at your text with me, verses 19 through 26. Paul says this, Because I know this will lead to my salvation through your prayers and help from the Spirit of Jesus Christ. My eager expectation and hope is that I will not at all be ashamed about anything, but that now, as always, with all courage, Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. Now, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me, and I don't know which one I should choose. I am torn between the two. I long to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Since I am persuaded of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ may abound. Now in the background of these verses is Paul's impending trial where he will either be released or he'll be put to death. And in light of this, Paul is detailing these two options in his own mind And his focal point comes in verse 19 where he says that his hope is that Christ will be highly honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Now he's confident that by the means of the Philippians' prayers and the help that comes from Christ, that he will not at all be ashamed at his trial, but rather with all boldness he will make much of Christ. He's anticipating his vindication. And the later verses reveal that he's confident actually that he's going to be released from prison. He's not going to be put to death. He's confident the Lord will preserve him. Now further detailing his mental tug of war that's going on in these verses between these two options, he says one of the most memorable lines in all of scripture. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now that is an incredible statement. Let's unpack both sides of this incredible verse. First, he says to live is Christ. Meaning as Paul lives, he has a singular focus of making much of Christ and making him known. This statement is intentionally broad because Christ consumed every part of Paul's life. Whatever Paul thought and whatever he did while he lived, he sought to make much of Christ and to have a singular driving factor, and that was Christ himself. Now he fleshes this out more in the following verses when he says, If I live on in the flesh... This means fruitful labor for me. And then he describes how he's confident that he will remain in the flesh so that he could help the Philippians progress in their advancement and joy in the faith. So while Paul lived, in other words, he lived for Christ and for making him known. His life was not his own. He did not live for the pleasures of this world. Rather, he lived all of his life in circumstances through the prism of magnifying Christ, of ministering Christ, and sharing Christ with anyone who would listen. But then the second half of this important verse, Paul says, to die is gain. Now, if you were ever looking for a phrase from the Christian life that is the exact opposite in this world, this might be the phrase. We live in a world that is fixated on self-preservation and avoiding aging and avoiding death at all costs. While this in large part is understandable, the world, there is no hope beyond this life in the world's eyes. Paul's mindset was totally different. For him, death had lost its sting, as you read about in 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because of what Jesus had done in Paul's life, there was no need for Paul to fear death anymore. He knew that when he died, he was going to be reunited with Christ. And not only that, but that he would get to see Christ face to face. This is why he says in verse 15, verse 23, I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. This is undoubtedly one of the greatest reasons why Paul was so faithful in sharing the gospel. He viewed his life primarily about ministry for Christ, and then he viewed his death about gain. And he basically said that either way, I get to make much of Christ, or I get to be with Christ. What a verse and what a challenge for us living today. My question for you and myself is, can we say that we have this mindset to live as Christ, to die as gain? I would venture to say that most of us don't have this mindset on a daily basis. In fact, as I was preparing this sermon, I have to confess, I I don't model this the way I want to. 
And I wish I did. But unfortunately, it is something that is difficult for us to embat and take upon. Well, if that is you as well, I want to give you a few thoughts. First, don't try and evade the conviction that verses like this bring. It is good for us as believers to be awakened and convicted of sin. There are so many churches today where they refuse to talk about sin because they're afraid that they're going to make people feel uncomfortable. Well, that's not what church is about. Church is not a social club. It is not a place where you go to feel good about yourself. It's a place where you go to be reminded of your sin and reminded of the cross and what Jesus has done to deal with your sin. So when you feel conviction about living a life that is less than pleasing to God, remember that that's okay first and foremost, and then turn your eyes to Christ. Second, confess this to your heavenly Father who loves you and sent His Son to die in your place, not only that you would be forgiven, but so that you would be empowered to live how He calls us to, to live a life that is to live as Christ and to die as gain. Third, remember that this is a daily mindset. This is not something that you can simply make your life burst and then never think about it again. This is something that you have to put on every single day. Today, Christ, I I want to live for you. Lord Jesus, help me this morning make much of you. Help me today to view my life as making much of you and my death as gain because I get to be with you. So seek to cultivate that in the mornings. Pray that every day. A life of faithfulness to Christ is taking a step at a time. So make a habit of reminding yourself of that. Fourth, what would it look like if this mindset was actually lived out in our lives? I'm sure there there'd be numerous examples, but here's a few. First, a, life, a, a, a mindset with this, a life with this mindset turns ordinary moments into gospel moments. All of our different daily routines are different. We all have different things that we do, and we each have moments where we're around non-believers to some extent more or less. So there's not some kind of fixed formula, but what I want to challenge you to do is to make much of Christ. So think of your daily schedule. What can you do to be around non-believers? Perhaps some of you, that's very simple. Your job is around non-believers all the day. Mine is not. Unfortunately, I work with a bunch of Christians. That's both a blessing and a curse. I have to intentionally try and make moments where I'm going to be around people who don't know Christ in order to weekly share the gospel. So a mindset A life with this mindset in view is going to seek to steward your life for specific ways to make much of Christ. So just think about it. How can you, on a week-in and week-out basis, be around people who need to hear the truth? And then make your schedule fit accordingly. Invite non-believers into your life to be a part of it. Second, as mentioned earlier in this sermon, a life lived for Christ is marked by humility. And Paul gives us a good example of this in our text. When he's considering both life and death, he says that dying and being with Christ is much better. Yet he says in verse 24 and 25, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. And since he was persuaded of this, he says that I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and join the faith. So Paul doesn't consider his own desires to be the most important. Rather, he thinks of the Philippians and he knows that it would be more beneficial for him to remain on in this life. So my point in bringing that back up is a life lived for Christ is one that is lived in humility where you consider others more important than yourself. So think about it. How could you live your life where others are more important than yourself? Perhaps that looks like complaining less and serving more. Perhaps it looks like sacrificing some of your time or resources to serve people. Third, a life that is marked by this mindset is one that is free to take risks on account of advancing the gospel. Just think about it as well. If death is truly gain for the Christian, and it is, we have every right and hope to be bold with the gospel regardless of the consequences. It is this mindset to live as Christ, to die as gain, that should give us hope and boldness with the gospel, with our family and friends and neighbors, co-workers, regardless of the cost. Now, in our current context, there's not much physical threat to us when we share the gospel. But what about if that changes? What about if things progressively go downhill in America for Christians? What are you going to do whenever the persecution does come, if it may? 
Are you going to stand firm on your convictions, on the Bible, on what you believe is true? Or are you going to cave to avoid the cost? It is this verse that will give you hope. To live as Christ and to die as gain will help you sacrifice and count the cost if that were to come. Now to wrap up this third element, this mindset may seem radical, may seem unfamiliar to you, but nonetheless, this is what every Christian has been called to adopt. Think of Jesus and His words. Count the cost. Die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow Me. The Christian life has never supposed to have been about ease and comfort and enjoyability, though, though there are those times. The cost of discipleship is something we all must consider on a daily basis. And a good example of this is lived out in the life of a missionary named Adoniram Judson. Adoniram Judson was a Baptist missionary to Burma for almost 40 years. We consider his ministry as a whole. Everything that he was able to accomplish in Burma, he was incredibly successful. He converted, the Lord used him to convert hundreds of Burmese from the Karen tribe to Christ. He translated the Bible into Burmese and until just recently. It was like the prominent translation that is still being used. This was 150, 200 years ago. So this is a pretty remarkable feat. He wrote numerous theological booklets for the Burmese. And he encouraged Baptist churches in America to unite for global missions. So the man's missionary endeavors were very successful from a historical perspective. Yet when you look at his life and ministry in depth and up close, you see that it was marked by obstacle after obstacle and trial after trial. He and his family were frequently sick. He was imprisoned for 19 months because it was assumed that he was a spy and he almost died in prison. He lost two wives and three children while serving. Yet in spite of it all, he was marked by an intense desire to make the gospel known. Why? What makes this man who left a prominent life and a comfortable life, go to a disease-ridden land where he will be hungry, where he will be fretful, where he will lose his closest family? Why would someone do that? Well, to live in his Christ and to die his gain is his answer. This mindset consumed him where he was concerned with making much of Christ and not himself. And so my prayer for you and me is that this mindset would also mark us that we would seek to advance the gospel because of the mindset that is given to us by God to magnify Christ and to make Him known. So to recap, we have seen that the first element needed to advance the gospel was trust, the second was humility, and the third was the proper mindset. Now, I have mentioned the gospel all throughout this sermon. In fact, it's in the slides. One of the things that I haven't actually done is taken the time to explain what the gospel is. While most of you, I'm certain, are very comfortable with it, I don't want to pass that there may be someone here who may not understand exactly what I'm referring to. As you know, we live in a very broken and sinful world. And this brokenness, this disaster-ridden place that we live was caused by sin and disobedience to God. Because God is holy, He cannot just simply let it go. He cannot just overlook our sin. Because God is holy, He has to give us what we deserve. He has to be just in order to actually be who He has said He is. And that means that He must give you the punishment of what you deserve for your sin. Instead of giving us what we deserve, He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, into the world to live a perfect life on our behalf so that He could die the death that we deserved. And He did that on the cross. On the cross, Jesus bore the punishment that we deserve for our sin. And then he was resurrected three days later, conquering sin and death. And now God calls you to turn from your sin and to place your faith in his son. If you will repent of your sins and turn away from them and believe in the good news of what Jesus was actually doing on the cross, you can be totally forgiven of your sins and reconciled to God. And you can have God both now and for all eternity. And if you're not a Christian, I would just ask you to do this even now, to repent of your sin. Take your eyes off of yourself. Cast them to Christ. There isn't a magic formula with this confession. Just confess your sin to God. Confess something like, God, I am a sinner. I know that I need you. And I believe in your son. I believe in what he has done 
in my place. If you haven't prayed a basic prayer like that to God, do it now. There's never been a, a better moment. Today is the day of salvation, the Bible says, because this good news, that simple, basic gospel message changes everything. And that is why we are supposed to be focused on advancing it both here and around the world. Because there's nothing better to be doing. There's nothing more worthwhile than making much of Christ, both in our lives and in the lives of others around the world. The church, it is my prayer that you would resolve to be united for the sake of advancing the gospel. And though New Year's resolutions frequently fade away and they're short-lived, my hope is that this resolution would mark your life for many years to come. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for who you are. Thank you for the simple good news of Christ, that we could do nothing to save ourselves, but that you have done it all. You have opened our eyes to see the truth of Christ, and I pray, God, that you would continue to remind us of the gospel now. God, help us not to live our lives in dependence on ourselves, but realize that we are utterly dependent upon you. God, I pray that you would help Strasburg Baptist Church be unified for the sake of advancing the gospel, both here in the broader community and around the world. And we confess we have nothing in this life except from you. We pray that you would help us to realize that and help us to commit ourselves to being faithful to it. In Jesus' name, amen.